and the outcome of seven years of efforts in this direction is nil. So it's clearly not enough for the Planning Commission to wash its hands of its responsibilities for inclusive growth by simply attributing the failure of inclusive growth to what they are pleased to call management failure on the part of state governments. A proactive role by the central government, especially in respect of centrally sponsored schemes, could make a breathtaking difference to the more efficient and effective delivery of public goods and services to the poor and the vulnerable. Only so will we be able to provide for a measure of equity in the face of the inescapable widening of inequalities in income and wealth promoted by the present high growth model. And I am beholden to Lord Meghna Desai for having stated unambiguously from this, from this lectern that these widening inequalities in income and wealth are typical of the capitalist mode of development. They were much worse perhaps at that stage owing to uh, political factors like colonialism and war. Now they are deliberately being brought in saying, and I beg Lord Meghna Desai's pardon for saying this, but the fact of the matter is that they do believe deeply that there is a contradiction between growth and equity and that measures which promote equity diminish growth and since the world applauds us for high growth and not greater justice, the image of India are becoming a superpower will depend entirely on having faster rates of growth and what does it matter if the poor continue to be dirty and not have opportunities of in-house toilets. I, however, argue that equity now and not in some distant future is essential for democracy to survive and development to be sustained. Let's not forget that India is the first country, not only in the world but in world history, to have become a full-fledged democracy before it even started on the road to development. In the United Kingdom, Catholics did not get the vote till 1832. That is about 70 years after James Watt watched that uh, kettle boiling. It's now 70 years since we went into development. And from day one, the minorities of India have had exactly the same civic rights as the majority in India. It was not till 1867 that in the mother of all parliaments, without property, you could have a vote. That was a hundred years after James Watt. And it was not till nearly 175 years later that women succeeded in getting the vote, which they exercised for the first time in 1928. In France, there was a revolution which talked of liberté, égalité, fraternité. But they forgot to mention sorority. So women in France didn't get the vote, and that's why they're the second sex, until after Hitler had occupied Germany, uh, had occupied France. They got to vote for the first time in 1945. In America, they announced that there was going to be, you know, everyone had the right to liberty in the pursuit of happiness, except they said the Red Indians and the Negroes. And so the Red Indians were deprived of all their land. It, was called, it wasn't called land acquisition there. It was called the expansion towards the West. And any Red Indian who objected was put into a reservation if he was not killed. And today they say, no, no, they're not called Red Indians anymore. That's politically incorrect. You should call them American Indians to distinguish them from Indian Americans. And uh, <laughs> as far as the Negroes are concerned, we're not allowed to use that word anymore. Uh, what we're supposed to call them is African Americans. But the African American was proclaimed as having been emancipated in 1863, and it was not till 1964 that Lyndon Johnson was able to give them full civic rights. But we in India have had affirmative action towards our disadvantaged sections from the day we became free. Now that's a major achievement. We are a democracy. We are about the only country of all the countries that have emerged into freedom since 1947, 
to have translated freedom for our country, independence for our country, into freedom for our people. But that is under serious threat today for the horizontalities which were identified by Professor Francis Stewart. We, our democracy cannot survive and our development cannot be sustained if we have this degree of non-equity in our society. This is not hyperbole but common sense. Already, close to one-third of the districts of India, particularly districts with a dominant tribal population, are convulsed in Marxist or Naxalite insurgencies fueled by deprivation and displacement. And when I looked at the three kinds of uh, horizontal inequalities in Professor Stewart's uh, presentation and saw the political, the social, and the cultural, all three come together in these tribal districts of India. And I would certainly recommend to her and her institution that they look not merely at the national entity to see which is uh, suffering in which direction, but come in India to look at these, uh, these districts which are infected with uh, Naxalism, with Marxism, uh, with uh, Maoism, and try to see why it is that they are so different to the other two-thirds of India. Grassroots development through grassroots institutions of democracy as provided for in the provisions of the Panchayats Extension to Scheduled Areas Act 1996, that is PESA, would do more to bring the tribal people back to the mainstream of democracy and development than any other single measure, including sending armies of soldiers into, uh, sorry, of policemen into these areas to shoot up whom they want and thereby think that they are rescuing these areas from Luxual violence. The key to grassroots governance lies, as Professor Pratap Bhanu Mehta said in his remarks, in a determined political will to surmount misconceptions and vested interests. While some state governments have displayed the will, others have not. The leader of the pack over the last decade and more has been Kerala, with Karnataka running a close second and some others, including West Bengal, Tripura, Sikkim, Madhya Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Goa, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Rajasthan, and Haryana, slowly catching up. But, what, but most others remain reluctant startups. Bihar is the dramatic exception. What Bihar has achieved in the last few years in promoting effective local self-government is the most encouraging development in Panchayat Raj. It shows how soon inclusive governance can yield to inclusive growth, provided Panchayat Raj becomes, by general consensus, the single most important plank of the domestic agenda of governance, growth, and equity. And that the government of India believes in Panchayat Raj will be proved when the Ministry of External Affairs vacates South Block next to the Prime Minister's office and instead of bringing Defence Ministry and Home Ministry into the vacated space, they provide it to the Ministry of Panchayat Raj, which notwithstanding its existence for the last eight years, is homeless in India at the moment because that is the importance that is given to it. At the moment, Panchayati Raj in India is a tribute a kind of obituary tribute to the dead Rajiv Gandhi and hardly the central plank of domestic governance, which is what it ought to be. And such a consensus can easily be achieved if we listen to the wisdom and compassion of the father of the nation. Asked in the 1930s what were his dreams for an independent India, Mahatma Gandhi replied, I shall work for an India in which the poorest shall feel that it is their country in whose making they have an effective voice. Thank you, Jayan. Thank you, sir.